Terry, you're here. You're not cut out of the process. We have to. We have to. <laughs> the writing of this, right here, we've been cut out of the loop. Uh, I just hope that we haven't created a monster by doing this. And we've contributed a lot. We've uh, initiated this process. And without being allowed to contribute to it, we've brought in and worked with uh, PBS on the Wild and Matter filming of their project. We've got new trails built, we've got existing trails repaired and reopened. And I think Mr. Spears has hit on a good idea. I think we ought to uh, maybe you guys can appoint a councilman. And, uh, create a coalition, sit down and discuss some of this, and I think we can come to a more formal agreement you know, where everybody's happy. How many members do you have, Terry, in your group? Six, about 65, plus or minus two or three. And uh, another issue is you state here that, that uh, your original intent was to encourage tourism, allowing OHVs to drive on city designated city streets. And then you put in bold letters for limited purpose of allowing them to reach public lands and open, open for use by OHVs only. That leads me to, to, uh, to understand that you are looking at uh, nullifying the special use permit for the large UTVs. Am I correct in saying that? No. Brian, would you be willing to speak to that? Yeah, so, I mean, that as drafted, that is already the law of the city. <coughs> the city already says that these are the streets that you can operate on. So what, what I'm looking into research, and if, if any member of the public is so inclined, they're, they're welcome to disagree with me. The section you're talking about is the newest section that's been added by the legislature. Those large ATVs, OHVs, whatever you want to call them, they're allowed to operate um, on general and minor county roads. Unless the county or the city, if any of those roads are contained in those municipalities, bars them from doing that. So what I'm looking into is whether or not there's a county, a general county or, or minor county road within the city that we can regulate. It also says in communities less than the population of 1,000, or 100,000. Why, why, uh, why did that not include the city of Ely. Look, I'm not going to get into a legal debate with you. I respectfully disagree with you that that is an often existing law. If, if there are county roads contained within the city, then arguably those limited classes of large ATVs can operate on those. I, I just don't know some, if that's the case. There was some question on that. Jim, do you know there aren't any designated county roads within city limits? There are city streets that they're in the city. Is that the section of Park Street? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so if there are, then the, then the law is right now that they can operate, because that's state law. Because the city, well, actually, they could operate. Well, but the city has barred them from operating because it's limiting its designated streets to the ones that okay. are in Okay, I'll give you that. But why? Why would you take away that privilege that the state affords us? Why would you do that? If we, we are already licensed properly that we have and that's that's not the intent, Terry. Well, that's maybe some of the clarity that we need to put in here, as well as the uh, motorcycle special license. That, that, be, that is the clarity in that section we referenced that you need a valid license specific to the OHB the operator is driving. If you're driving a motorcycle, the license you need is an M endorsement on your license. So that doesn't include the OHB. No, the, the, the state, well, correct right, if I'm wrong, Brian, well, let's, is you let's just need a license. And OHB includes a, cast, a class of vehicles which are motorcycles. It does. And OHB is a motorcycle. It's, you can go look it up on the state website. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're right or wrong. I don't know. It's not my fault. I mean, I've, I've, yeah. I've read some of that and I've also read where they could possibly class it as a motor vehicle. Side by side. I'm talking about side by side specific. 
Are well, you about the big ones? Yes. Okay, so I did a lot of research on this, and the big <coughs> ones, like I said, the, the latest change to this particular chapter of the statutes were to address those. And the idea that Senator Bogachia had was that people who lived in rural areas who operated those larger OHVs or UTVs or whatever you want to call them, I mean, all of them are lumped into OHV for state purposes. You should see the list. I mean, it's it's pretty much anything that can go off-road and has four-wheel drive or a motorcycle. I mean, it's a lot of stuff, right? So they tried to single out these large ATVs and give them a definition if they fit four people or if they have a truck bed, that's a large ATV. What? I think it's four. Anyway. Um, so the idea was, in more rural areas where these folks are already out on county roads, why not just basically put a rubber stamp on their ability to operate on those unless the county or whoever controls the county road opts out of that. Conversely, a city may opt in to allow the operation as long as it's state lawful, helmet, license, running lights, depending. <clears throat> they can opt in and say, these are the streets that I want you to operate on only for the limited purpose of going to and from your public areas. That is the only authority the state has granted us. We can't just willy-nilly change the motor vehicle code and say that anybody can drive on city streets. And so what I was, you know, I wasn't here yet. What I understand was there was plenty of discussion <clears throat> about which streets were going to be designated so people could actually reach these areas. And I think that's a cheat. I mean, like I said, the only real difference that we have from state law is that we're imposing liability insurance on those who operate on city streets. And that's going to be a sticking point. It's just a, a really a political decision. I mean, it's not illegal to do that. Now, I can say that that particular, if you, if you went back and looked at the legislative history for that 2003 change in the law that really opened the door to, to counties and cities allowing people to operate on their roads and, and streets, they had liability insurance as part of the law all the way up until the final reading. And I, there's, I have no notes or minutes to indicate why that was taken out. I don't know if, if folks like you came out and forced and said, you know, you're going to shut down the tourism or what? So, I mean, the legislators of this state were thinking about it for most of that session to make sure to, to impose a liability insurance on every operator who's going to operate on the street or a county road. That's I have just a question. You're saying that? Ma'am, ma'am, public comments at the end of the meeting. Thank you. Can you ask me one more thing? Yes, sir. Yeah, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that the way that NRS stated is that every county road, unless the county designates one, you can't. That's right. They can't allow the entire yeah. county. So it's a, it's a designated a county road, road but they the county has to opt out, the city has to opt in. Yeah, only yeah. on a specific road. They can say, not the entire county road. Oh, yeah. no, I'm pretty sure they could probably just say none. The, the county has all, already given us three uh, uh, Give, giving us a green light. If it's a county rule, we can use it. No restrictions. And you can check with uh, Shane Barbie on that. He was on the committee that we were in contact with. Uh, Thank you, Terry. Did you have any other last points you'd like to make on this? That's, that's basically it. I, do, I just want to state that I agree with Ed. I think sure. we ought to get together and, and talk about this a little bit more. Well, then that sounds like what's going to happen. I do appreciate the OHP's input on getting this passed. I think initially it's something that needed to be done. Um, however, as it was as as it was composed and approved, there were significant holes in the ordinance that needed to be addressed. And um, while the OHP group was instrumental in getting this passed, there are people who live along this route who also deserve to be heard. If they have concerns, those are also valid. Um, and I think we need to address those as well and any of the liability out there. I'm not against doing this or pushing for tourism, and I think part of the city's push for that is doing a grant to do more educational materials. But to do educational materials, we have to have a basis from which to pull information to put in the educational pamphlets. And as I was telling Terry on the phone earlier, the sheriff's office and the city were having a heck of a time sussing out what the original code allowed or didn't allow. And to produce materials, you can't have those confusions. Um, we've got to tighten this up so that we can do the education and outreach to the community for the locals as well as for people that visit here. Um, it's better to know exactly what you can and can't do than to just 
you know, do what you're going to do and hope you don't get in trouble. Nobody wants to live in that kind of space. Um, so, I, okay. we do have a motion. And okay, Mr. Mayor, yes. can I say one more thing? Sure. Two seconds. <clears throat> Is it possible to table this? There's already a motion on the floor to table. Okay. Just <coughs> tell you get your grant and get your educational and safety program ready to roll and then enact whatever. Uh, I believe the deadline for the grant is. Well, the deadline is November 12th. Well, um, but you can get the grant. I, I think it's. I think those grants pretty much have a year to complete whatever the project. We is. have some time. So I agree, but it's got to. It's got to be done. We can't leave the ordinance the way it sits. There's got to be some corrections in there, whatever those corrections may be. That's what I'm talking about. Um, but it, it's got to be done, and it's got to be done sooner than later. I'm okay with tabling it, and I'm okay with us discussing this with some other groups, including the people who live along those routes and have had complaints about whatever their issues are. They've got to be part of the discussion as well. Um, but did you have something else to add? There? Yes, I do. I received an email from Nikhil Marquis with OHA Commission. He said, good afternoon, Jennifer. Please consider presenting the need for helmets as a way to improve OHP safety and education in the EMU community. At this time, the OHP program will not be submitting an official comment to Ordinance 725 up for reading this evening. And I'd like to add that in my research this afternoon, um, I researched Idaho's provisions on the Fish and Game website. Um, there was a question asked, does this law allow children to ride on roads? No. When traveling on roads, operators of an off-highway motorcycle, ATV, or UTV must have a valid driver's license, carry liability insurance, and have a vehicle equipped with the required equipment to do so. Utah. To operate on county roads or NPS roads, the OHP must meet all safety and equipment requirements for street legal OHP from their state of origin including liability insurance and a metal license plate. And then it goes on to say all Arizona state motor vehicle laws and regulations are applicable. And Sheriff Hinoy is in full support of, of this ordinance. Uh, Brian and the mayor and myself met with him Tuesday, and he is very supportive. And Platt told us that the ordinance the way it sits right now is not enforceable. And, you know, I know Brian, when, like you said, he's gone back through minutes on the state assembly meetings. Um, we've met with the uh, uh, sheriffs. Uh, we've met with um, together trying to find solutions to this. And if the OHP club would like to be included in some revisions here, that's fine. But there will be revisions. And I need to be clear on that. I'm not saying that there might not be a need for revisions. Thank you. Thank you. So my two cents real quick. If, yeah. if the biggest hang up is a liability insurance, I'd really like to see the council say that they'd like to move forward without that bid. We can take that up again at another time. Well, but I, I'm concerned about the liability insurance yeah. because I live on Murray Street where that little stretch of road is and my car's parked on Murray Street and my kids cross Murray Street. So who's responsible if someone is driving in an OHB down Murray Street and hits my kid? Who pays for that? Whose liability insurance pays for that? But you have to have liability insurance. Ma'am, public comment is at the end. She was asking the question and I was answering. It was rhetorical and not from the audience. So that's a concern of mine. Yeah. I mean, if we can look at it again later, yeah. that's fine. I only say that because one section is in conflict with state law, so it would be nice to get that. Do you want to, re do you want to resolve the conflict? Conflict with state law. And I mean, that's just area. my city attorney request. I'm not. The motion on the floor is the table, and we do have a second on that. We're currently having a discussion. Is there any other discussion on the side? <coughs> I, I guess my only question is um, Mr. McIntosh brought up the suggestion to have a council member work with their club and then anyone else says. Roberts would like to have 
that will smoothly decide. So. Would you like to make that part of your motion? I would make that part of my motion to have council member serve. Which council member? I made the motion to table, but I'll amend my motion oh. to appoint, have the mayor appoint somebody that's in the OHVs to meet with the group to try to resolve this issue. That's something for the next meeting. Okay. Yeah, I got three of them. <laughs> so, Council Member Spirits, yeah. okay. okay. So, then, I'm sorry, I didn't know you made the motion. Who was, you were the second? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 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 You'll second that as a shooter. Absolutely. Okay. Is there any other discussion on this? All in favor for table? All right. Um, any opposed? Carried in so order. <coughs> Mr. McIntosh, you'll get a councilman spear on that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to item four, Mayor Robertson, discussion for possible action, approval to move ordinance 728, bill number 12 to second reading. Ordinance 728 amends chapter three of title three of city code of the city of Ely regulating short-term residential rentals, exempting rental businesses exempt from state business licensing, from state bus from city business licensing, adding severability clause. Do I have a second? I have a second. Discussion on the side. Yeah, I, I have a question. On the very first page, I guess, just need a little education. In the summary where it says, uh, exempting rental businesses exempt from state business license, licensing from city business licensing. What's it mean? Right. So, yeah, so right now, I think there's been a little bit of confusion about what our existing rental business code regulates. Long term or short term? More long term. Well, that's right, regulate short term or long term. But, so, long term. It, it's argued, if not argued, it, it, it requires a business license for people who wouldn't be required to have a state business license. It, the state exempts you from having a business license if your sole business is, I believe, three or fewer dwelling units, like a young free house or something like that, and you rent them out. I think it's, uh, I don't think I four. Well, if four is in here, that's because it's four or more. Is oh, okay. Like that, right? so, we trigger after the state drops off, if that makes sense, okay. right? And, and really what I try to do is just kind of dovetail on the existing regulations, except for that, just because I think there was sort of a misconception about who uh, would have to get a business license here. Some people were probably operating without a business license, and not just in the city, too. I think it's parallel in the county as well. Uh, and, and so the way I presented it was just to bring it in line with the state law, just so, like, if you don't need one for the state, and that's your only business, you have three or less, you don't need one for the city. But like anything else, that could be a matter. Well, part of the problem being, too, that part of our city business license requirement is that you have a state business license. But if you're doing something that doesn't require a state business license, how are we going to require them to have a city business license? And that's we just could. for, we could, I suppose, yeah. but we would have to yeah. change how we do that. Yeah. So this was just changing or clearing up some of that. Yeah, just a proposal to bring it in line with the state. So it would be easy for someone in that position who may not know that they're violating the law here to do any other questions on this item? Yeah, on page two, mm -hmm. where it comes down in the center, it says uh, Recreation Act, or Recreation or Recreation Board. And then, so everything after that, is, is that this? Yeah, this is just the definition section, and these are just remnants from whoever drafted this in 86 or something like that. I mean, I struck that whole paragraph relating to county licensing from the treasurer, because that just isn't accurate as to how we do business anymore. I, I'm more than happy to strike recreation board too because it, I don't think it applies. I mean, I, I, there must have been a concerted effort in the count, on the county and the city's part at the time they drafted these to work together, maybe from one master document, because there's just redundancy in them. Sure. Okay, so, so I'm just clear with that. So if there's not a line on the side, we're not doing nothing with that. Then. Yeah, it's, it would just stay the same. I mean, we, we could obviously strike that if, if you're so inclined just to clarify it. I mean, I like what And then on um, page four, which you're probably just going to talk about what you just said. How, how do we, on that first paragraph, or that first partial paragraph, you know, uh, receive 12.5% of my gross income. How does the city know, and I'm referring to Airbnb, is being used? If we don't how do we ever know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, how do we, you know, how do we know that you're speeding? Well, we don't until there's someone out there that sees you, right? 
Well, I'm sure MREC does a lot of that enforcement. With the and hotels. Look, these are going to so, pop up on websites. So I'm sure yeah, that, that Tormac is going to be keen to go look at Airbnb or VRBO yeah. or whatever the heavy hitters are. Because they're listed on the website. Yeah. Be easily okay, so, so there's some, some watchdog, I guess, out there doing that. Not a watchdog, it's something straight out of the I mean, I think the biggest watchdog is going to be the community, right? I mean, they're going to know when somebody's operating a short term rental business next door because there's going to be people coming and going every weekend. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, down on the bottom of that page, score. On, the, on item two. It says the short-term residential rental is if it's located within 660 feet of another short-term residential line property. Two houses, say so somebody's got two RBBs right next door to each other. Mm -hmm. Does that affect that or? Don't yeah, it would. I mean, so the idea. What I was, I was only asked to really implement a couple specific things, and one of them was sort of a density requirement, just, just so they couldn't pop up everywhere unregulated. Uh, a 660, I believe, was what Henderson's doing or North Las Vegas. So that's just a number they use. I, I plug it in. I, I'm well, and then you can't have one right next to another one and just kind of chain these things and turn a whole neighborhood into Airbnb. Is it kind of a staple of any hmm. of these residents? Well, it is. I mean, that's kind of the trend that regulation is. I'll have to check yeah. up in my neighborhood. I think there may be two within that 660 feet. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it what? I'm sorry. It's a property owners. If they're three different property owners. Hey, yeah. If it's a flight, even if it's not, I mean, first in time, first in right. So, I mean, if we arbitrarily apply, if, if yours was first and we said, oh, you're now you're 660 feet of the second guy's, yeah, it's a problem. Yeah, block away, block yeah. half away. I mean, for example, my, my family has a house in Hurricane, which they rent out as an Airbnb, but with the city of Hurricane, there was a cap on how many you could even have in the city total. So they were only able to get a license when somebody else relinquished their license. Oh, sure. Um, and so this is kind of the same effect that, hey, we don't want an entire neighborhood to be turned over to rentals because that ruins the housing market and ruins the neighborhood for homeowners. If there's one homeowner left yeah. amongst the Airbnb. So one of the areas we looked at was Douglas County, with Lake Tahoe, and just sort of how rampant the problems were out there with people coming up and partying and all that stuff. So, but, you know, the, the idea is to, I was asked to draft some sort of density limit and we can revisit it or come up with a better number or put a cap in a certain neighborhood or whatever, so. Without without dividing the city up into different neighborhoods specifically and doing maps and doing all of this, this seemed like the cleanest solution to do that was a, a distance requirement, but we're, we're open to suggesting this goes. Good start. Any other questions or notes? We have a motion, we have a second. All in favor? All right. Any opposed? Very so ordered. We'll move on to item six. Councilman Allworth discussion for possible action. Establishment of terms for conditional special use permit to allow existing mobile home parks within the city of Ely to have RV trailers and motor homes parked within their confines for temporary construction workers and direction of the city attorney's draft ordinance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done a great job and, and Brad added some stuff. I believe it was Brad, maybe it was a definition of you know, recreational trailer park mobile home defined. I've been working with a group over, I don't really know what to call it, downtown, say the city group. But you know, we're having this housing shortage, not only with, the, with basically with the contractors coming into town. So we started with this idea, and then that group, excuse me, I can't remember the name of it. Main Street. Main Street, you know. So, so they're picking up on this, and they think it's a great idea. We just need to move forward. And they're, they asked me at the last meeting, how are, how's the city going to go out and say, hey, at, at that point, I talked to the city park league, is it really the city's responsibility, for example, if they're the whole, uh, owner of a trailer park back there right now, and uh, do we have to go knock on our door to me? That might upset another person up the street that, hey, why don't you come knock on my door? I think once it gets past that point, Maybe this uh, okay. Main Street program they can advertise for. I think we need to keep the city out of that so we're not yeah, it's base it's exactly right. So I think it's a great idea. Uh, again, you know what? Brad sent out some stuff on different pictures. I think it's got another 
uh, for very last page. I just wonder, I mean, that's a fancy looking typical site utility layout. But some people's not going to have that. I don't know why that's in Mark County or either where it's at. But I don't you know. I mean, I want everything to be legal. But we got to do something because we got a housing shortage here. That's all there is to it. Well, I, I guess take help from, from the RV. Okay. Because we had a, a meeting that was very well received. So I'm glad it's moving forward with this right here. There's nothing to add with it. Any other people want to add to it? Yeah, I, I make a motion to move forward with forward with that uh, item, establish returns for conditional permit use. The purpose of the item is to decide on the permit here. Um, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. Direction to me, right? Yeah, it looks like okay. you know who I'm going to be working with. Right? So, okay. yeah, I don't think you have to do all the, all the heavy lifting tonight. Okay. <laughs> so we have a motion, do we have a second? I would second. Any further discussion on this item? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carried and so ordered. Thanks for your work on that, Um Item 7, City Council, or Council Member City Attorney File Discussion for Possible Action. Approval of Resolution 2019-17 to increase adoption fees to $60 for dogs. Uh, so this is already approved. Uh, what we came to find out that a resolution is needed to, to make it legal, says our city judge. Okay. I'll entertain a motion on this item. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, I have oh, some discussion. Sorry. I, I've received phone calls saying 60 bucks is too much. Because my kids have been collecting money to get a dog. And <laughs> now, can't afford it. You know, I mean, that might be a bleeding heart story. I, I think the 60 bucks is too high for my, myself. Uh, but that's my opinion. Any other discussion on this item? We have a motion and we have a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Okay, thank you. Item 8, Councilman Allworth, discussion for possible action. Discussion to city staff to send a letter to City Police Chief Henry requesting that his officers verify city business licensing for out of town, out of the area businesses. I think this is just part of our city code. That's the police department's duty to do that. They go around town. We see they, they drive around and see somebody hanging on a breaking on their uh, air conditioning unit at our place too. I think somebody should ask them. But it's that simple. I mean, they're patrolling the streets all the time. That, that's something out of the abnormal. They should ask it. I've called uh, building inspector uh, Brad Christensen, and each time I've talked to him, he researched it. And well, we had a permit in 2013 or the business license. And you shut them down until they give what they pay for it. So if a normal citizen is doing it, and the citizen should be able to, the sheriff's office, call the city hall, let the city hall send the law enforcement up there to do it. But you know, it's, it's all, it's happening around here. We're all seeing it. So we, we need to have the sheriff's office, police department, step up the game a little bit. Uh, yeah, there's going to be a letter coming out, of course. Uh, yeah, and it's going to be from the, a letter from the council. Do you have a motion to that? Yes, I do. Motion to uh, say so we get the police department to follow the city code. Okay. Sure. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion on this item? <coughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carried and so ordered. Uh, item 9, Councilman Plankus. Discussion for possible action, direction to city staff to prepare a resolution changing the time for regular city council meetings to 1 p.m. Yes, I do believe that uh, this is uh, necessary at this time because we do have employees that have to come to the meetings and so paying them overtime to sit here and whatnot. And with winter coming on and icy roads and inclement weather, I just kind of think having a, an earlier meeting during the day would be more beneficial to this city than waiting until late in the evening. Okay, would you like to make a motion then? Yes, I'd like to make a motion that we pursue the idea of uh, changing our meeting time to 1 p.m. Do I have a second for that? I'll second that. Discussion? I would strongly disagree with that. Um, not only because I have a job, but I do have a job. 
But I have a boss who's very, uh, very flexible with me and would allow me to come to a one o'clock council meeting, but not everyone has that flexibility. And, you know, I think when the majority of your voting populace works, uh, we have to make it available for people to be here to participate in discussion. Well, if I'm not mistaken, not too many years ago we moved the meetings from 4 to 5 for that right. very purpose. Trying to make it more available. Well, I think it's time that we make some, uh, some alterations in that factor. The county meets begins at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, other uh, agencies or state or state offices or local uh, different, have different time meetings and whatnot. Moving it to 1 o'clock gives a person to change their lunch time in order to make their make the meeting from their lunch time to 1 o'clock. And I think it'd be extremely beneficial to the city and conduct this business in a more community type of manner, as a matter of fact. If people have a reason to come to the city council for a meeting, they'll be here regardless what time we have. Oh, I don't think I don't think that's the case. I, and I don't think that should be required of people. We are gonna have this meeting at this time and you better make sure you make it here. The county starts at 9.30 because their meetings go most of the day. Our meetings are a couple of hours. It's, I, I don't think it's fair to preclude people from attending a, a public meeting for the people that they elect into office because it gets dark early. Do you have a discussion on the side? I think meeting time doesn't really make a difference to me, but the county did their, like Michelle said earlier in the day, and I do believe a lot of people showed up here today, the firefighters, EMT, back there, they showed up because of the agenda item. The OHD people showed up tonight because there was an item they were interested in. And they would be here at 1 o'clock, they'd leave that strong with it, they'll be there. And again, you know, we're elected, if we didn't have a public meeting, we're elected, they won't even come to me because they think we're going to do the best job we can and they're going to come up and pound on the table because you're not doing a good job. And I don't <laughs> think that the point of that we're sitting up here in this council that we have to write every idea was going to be right. I think it's just one of the deals that if we change the meeting, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Change it back. I think changing the meeting tells the general populace that you don't care what their voice is. When we have the availability. I've worked with the general public on many different uh, committees and whatnot. And if they're interested in what you're doing, or they have an interest in some subject on our agenda, they will be here even if you're holding it at midnight. Now, uh, I'm looking to the fact that we also have to take and preserve our people that are working for the city also, and also our finances and whatnot. We don't have the greatest <coughs> amount of finances, but if we're continuously have to pay overtime to have our employees come up to the meeting after they're working out, I don't think it's beneficial. Any further discussion? I have one question. I'm going to ask Mr. Craycraft. If we had a meeting at 1 o'clock and you had to bring, say, Carl in here, what kind of is I guess you know, your road department, your water crew guy, do they, do they relay to you enough information that you can report accurately or, yes. or you, you feel it I do. by having them come to the meeting, sit here to their part of the first part of the meeting, that would be beneficial? That's a good question. There would, there would be times that they wouldn't be beneficial to have Carl come or Tom come in. Right, during the report section. Then yeah. Be. yeah. That would be beneficial, especially at Tom, but the, you got so much, uh, is, what do you call it? Uh, <laughs> well, he had so many permits and stuff that it would be difficult for me to answer. Because I think one of the earnest concerns is what we're paying in overtime for people sitting here. I don't know if you and Jeanette are on the or whatever. You, like today well, would have been a good example. The three of us are on salary. Yeah. So three right there. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the extra cost is never. But today would have been a perfect example. We have our old. And now mm -hmm. the other could have came in. But in that case, we'd be pulling them off their regular duties to come to a meeting. No, that all comes twice a month. Sure, but I'm talking about like Tom or oh, yeah, yes. Carl or yeah. whoever else we would need. 
because my idea, I didn't know how they were paid, would be you have to you do the agenda lined out where they come in, first in, first out, they're gone. Yeah. So they're not being delayed. So that'd be a possibility of yeah. that. Okay. Any other discussion on this item? With that, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. All right. All opposed? Just, just to know, uh, Attorney Kyle, we'll have to prepare a resolution to change the act to change the sign. We'll move on to item 10. Now I'm going to get a lot of Michelle Beecher. Okay. Discussion for possible action. Appointment of Council Member Michelle Beecher with the City Council's consent to serve as an appointed director on the Nevada Northern Railway's Board of Directors. And uh, just so the council is aware, we did receive um, a document from the attorney who represents the Railroad Foundation asking that this item be tabled um, so that the council can take up their proposed amendment to the bylaws. Um, that, those, that document's in front of you. Uh, the way it was presented was that um, the way that the bylaws are written, they didn't think that Michelle had the authority to appoint herself. Uh, I disagree with that. I think there was sort of a misinterpretation of the word elected, which is in there, but there is some clarifying language. So if the board, if the council wanted to take up that issue and, and ministerially make that change so it's clear in the bylaws when there is voting and who could vote, they could do that. Uh, it would just require us to table it tonight. Uh, the only other change that I saw was their proposal. I don't have an opinion on this. It's up to the council, but their proposal would actually expand the mayor pro tem's ability to appoint him or herself to this board um, beyond the tie break uh, power that's vested in the Nevada Revised Statute. So the, the, the mayor pro tem could actually, under their proposal, she could actually vote for herself to be on the foundation's board. So that's the only difference that they're proposing. So. If I could, I attended the meeting about that this afternoon. Do you want to? Yeah, no, I got one. Oh, okay. But the railroad meeting, yeah. they call it red line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, and I signed on approving to let her nominate herself. But so that. In that capacity. Yeah, right. And then they had another page for the city to sign, but they told me I had to sign in front of the council. So I didn't sign it. Right. And that would, that would come later. So I just, I just wanted to keep the council informed that this is hot off the press. I got an email last night asking that this item be tabled. That's up to the council, and I think you're fully informed, so. Would we need to table if we know that they voted in favor? Probably That's should the give the document, because they had the red line and they had the whole, so actually the blue line they had in there, but they changed yeah. it. Probably should look at the official document. But, you know, they, they want, they want you on the board. They want to kick you over there. Right. Right. So. Uh, well, I've looked at it. I mean, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it, it is what it purports to be with the changes that I've highlighted. It's really just a decision as to whether or not, you know, the council wants to move forward tonight with the authority that I think is already vested in uh, Michelle. I'm in mean, board. I mean, or I mean, to table it. So. Okay. So we have I a motion. Make the motion to I'd like a little further discussion, and I'd like to ask Michelle, but, uh, if you're appointed to this, uh, to the Railroad Foundation, exactly where would your duties and your alliance be? Uh, we will be negotiating with the Railroad later on this year, in the beginning of next year, with some major problems that we have between the city and the Railroad. Now, right. where would your alliance be, with the city or with the Railroad? Obviously, my alliance would always be with the city. That's, this is where I was appointed. This is where my alliance is. Well, that's a good question. I mean, I'm glad for your answer. And it relieves something that I have in mind that uh, we should ask that question. So thank you.